quantum mechanics, black holes, genetic regulatory networks, systems biology, ecosystem science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Science, math, logic, probing the mysteries of time and space. Get your nerdy talk here with everyone's favorite scientist on Talk Nerdy to Me. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jack. Join us as we travel through space on this little blue ball during our temporary visit to the third planet around a particularly nondescript yellow star. And as we contemplate the world, the universe, and everything around and within us, our goals, our comprehension and understanding, our tools, our science and observation, our vehicle, our minds and our imaginations. We will be piecing together myriad facts, figures, conjectures, and speculations on the really big questions like what existed before the universe? What is the fundamental nature of time? What is gravity? What is consciousness and what is life? We'll approach these questions with a childlike curiosity, a hunger to learn and hopefully discover something about the universe and about ourselves. And we will hopefully also end up with more questions than answers because, after all, science is for asking questions. So, let's begin. Well, welcome everyone to the first episode of Talk Nerdy to Me. My name is Dr. James Lyons-Weiler and I'm here to make new friends, explore new boundaries, and learn together with you about all of the things that I love to learn about and all the things that I'm curious about and share this journey of exploration with you. Today is October 27th, 2020, and this new product of WWDNYK Studios has been a dream of mine for some time. Um, I have been reading extensively on the materials with which we will be discussing. Uh, we will be sharing ideas. And what I'd like to encourage everyone to do is as thoughts occur to you, uh, please share them with me in the comments. This should not be a one-sided dialogue. I'm not here to lecture. I'm here to discover and explore. So with that, what I'd like to do is begin. The way that Talk Nerdy to me is going to work is when I find an article that I think is fascinating, I'm going to read the article to you. So this is an opportunity to sit back, relax, enjoy some coffee, some chai, some water. The article for today appeared in September in 2020. It's found in the dailygalaxy.com and its title is The Invisible Universe, A Primordial Magnetic Soul Pervades the Cosmos. I'll be pasting a link to the article. It's in the Astronomy, Cosmology, Science, Universe section of the dailygalaxy.com. There are some beautiful thoughts here in this article and I may come in and out of commentary as I read these articles. As I go into commentary, I'll preface it by letting you know that I'm parting from the text and into my own stream of consciousness. The article begins, the world's astronomers are increasingly probing the mystery of where the enormous magnetic fields that permeate our universe come from, from Earth to Mars to the Milky Way to intergalactic voids and beyond the darkest, most remote regions of the cosmos. The death of Mars. A half billion years ago, Mars' magnetic field that protected an ocean as deep as the Mediterranean Sea was switched off. An impact basin deep enough to swallow might Mount Everest in Valles Marinas reveals which might be the results of an ancient asteroid the size of Pluto colliding with the red planet switching off its magnetic field, bathing the red planet in harmful radiation, 
and eroding its atmosphere by particles streaming from solar winds. Today, Marge is a frigid desert world with a carbon dioxide atmosphere 100 times thinner than the Earth's. A strong magnetic field had probably played an important role in protecting the atmosphere from the solar wind and keeping the planet wet and habitable. Venus and Mars have negligible magnetic fields and do not support life, while Earth's magnetic field is relatively strong and does, said Sarah McIntyre at Australia National University. We find most detected exoplanets have very weak magnetic fields, so this is an important factor when searching for potentially habitable planets. <clears throat> an unseen magnetic soul. Anytime astronomers figure out a new way for looking for magnetic fields in ever more remote regions of the cosmos, inexplicably they find them, observes Natalie Walchover in Quanta about the invisible magnetic field lines that loop and swirl through intergalactic space like the grooves of a fingerprint. An unseen magnetic soul. Magnetism is primordial, she writes, tracing all the way back to the birth of the universe. In that case, weak magnetism should exist everywhere, even in the voids of the cosmic web, the very darkest, emptiest regions of the universe. The omnipresent magnetism would have seeded the stronger fields that blossomed into galaxies and clusters. In 2019, astronomers discovered 10 million light years of magnetized space spanning the entire length of a filament of a cosmic web, part of the massive web that fills much of space, connecting two galaxy clusters dubbed Abel 0399 and Abel 0401 that are slowly colliding with each other. The cosmic web. We're just looking at the tip of the iceberg probably, said Federico Gavoni of the National Institute for Astrophysics in Cagliari, Italy, who led the first detection using the Low Frequency Array radio telescope to observe the bridge of radio emitting plasma extending between the two galaxy clusters that are approaching a merger. The results imply that intergalactic magnetic fields connect the two clusters and challenge theories of particle acceleration in the intergalactic medium. The cosmic web shown here in a computer simulation of massive filaments of galaxies separated by giant voids. Primordial magnetism might also help resolve another cosmological conundrum known as the Hubble tension, observed Welchover, pointing out that it is probably the hottest topic in cosmology. While the Hubble constant is constant everywhere in space at a given time, it is not constant in time, explains Chris Foschnock, professor of physics at UC Davis, about the current crisis in cosmology or tension in understanding the rate of expansion of the universe known as the Hubble constant since the Big Bang, a central part of the quest to discover the origins of the universe. Dark energy is incredibly strange. Some physicists meanwhile propose dark energy is a quote fifth force beyond the four already known, gravitational, electromagnetic, and the strong and weak nuclear forces. However, researchers think this fifth force may be screened or hidden for large objects like planets, making it difficult to detect. Dark energy is incredibly strange, but actually it makes sense to me that it went unnoticed, said Nobel Prize winning physicist Adam Rees in an interview in The Atlantic. I have absolutely no clue what dark energy is. Dark energy appears strong enough to push the entire universe, yet its source is unknown, its location is unknown, and its physics are highly speculative. In a paper posted online in April, and under review with physical research, physical review letters, the cosmologists Karsten Jadamzik and Levon Pogosian, a professor of physics at Simon Fraser University in Canada, proposed that weak magnetic fields in the early universe would lead to the faster cosmetic expansion seen today. Like a living organism. Astrophysicist at Johns Hopkins, led by Nobel laureate Adam Rees, say researchers need to find conclusive evidence of primordial magnetism that appears to be everywhere is the missing agent 
that shaped the universe. Everyone knows that it's one of those big puzzles, said Pagosian, but for decades there was no way to tell whether magnetism is truly ubiquitous and thus a primordial component of the cosmos, so cosmologists largely stopped paying attention. Magnetism is a little bit like a living organism, said Torsten Evslin, a theoretical physicist at the Max Planck Institute of Astrophysics. Because magnetic fields tap into free energy source, they can hold and onto and grow. They can spread and affect other areas with their presence where they grow as well. This was the Daily Galaxy, Max Goldberg, via the hidden magnetic universe begins to come into view quanta in science. Now, some speculative comments on my part. The primordial forces of the universe came about, as far as we understand it, through a combination of accidents at the beginning of what we know as the Big Bang. We know that initially all of the forces, or we think that all of the forces were one. That doesn't make any sense to most people. How can all of the forces be one? What are we talking about? Well, we have electromagnetism. That in and of itself is electro and magnetic, those two forces that are combined. We have the weak force, which we'll no doubt be reading articles on in the future. We have other forces such as um, gravity. These are considered forces, but if you understand the mechanics as well as we think we understand them in, involved in the fundamental forces, there's something about these forces that make them as they have come into being an inevitability. Now this doesn't mean that the fate of the universe is set nor established. When I say inevitable, there's an inevitability that if you're at the top of a hill and you're sitting on your sled and you point the sled downhill and you sit on the sled and there's snow on the ground, there's an inevitability in the consequence of orienting physical objects if you, the sled, the snow, on a slope. The inevitability is a reconciliation of something. You're at the top and something has to be reconciled. We use terms like potential energy and kinetic energy to try to understand that inevitability. But in models of the Big Bang, at the beginning, where we have what we call the quantum gravity era, there was no matter. At the very beginning, there were all forces combined into one. We simply had whatever quantum gravity is at the quantum level, which we still don't understand today. The effects of gravity at scales at which quantum effects are now understood and taken for granted are not really well known. Qua gravity itself may be an emergent property of interactions and reconciliations among the variables of which we will no doubt speak over and over and over again as we explore these problems. At the very beginning of time, a very short, short period of time, 10 to the minus 40th seconds, there was an inflationary period under the Big Bang model. During that inflationary period, three forces separated out of the quantum gravity force Electroweak force, strong force, and gravity. They were separate and existed in this universe as three forces interacting with each other, influencing how the expansion was happening, co-influencing, feeding back with each other, perhaps causing further inflationary expansion. Shortly thereafter, at about 10 to the minus 2 seconds, the universe as we know it, with the forces that we understand so far, the electromagnetic, the weak, the strong, and the gravity came into being as the electromagnetic force and the weak force separated. Now, what does all of this mean? 
we're going to be getting into each of these in great detail as we go further and further into our explorations. I have a collection of a very large number of articles. I have at least 130 articles that I'd like to explore with you on the fundamentals of how the universe works, how it came into being, questions about the Big Bang, the origins of matter, questions about the process of the universe's expansion and how we measure it, questions about matter itself, which I have come to understand as a continuum, not a discrete packet. The molecules in your body are a continuum of existence involving an interplay between energy and matter. We'll be just discussing the nature of gravity as well as we can understand it. And by the time we get there a few months from now, perhaps we'll understand it a little better than we do now. We'll discuss spooky action at a distance, the double slit experiment and entanglement. We'll discuss quantum field theory as we all swim in this field that we call the universe or this field of fields as I have come to understand it. The quantum tunneling itself is a mysterious phenomenon that we'll talk about, including an example of superposition. We'll discuss whether things can travel faster than light and under what conditions. I'm very interested in quantum computing and the applications of this knowledge for technology, potential new energy sources that might be useful to our universe anyway. We'll be discussing the strange fit between the mathematics of physics and physics itself. And I will be trying to disabuse myself of the notion that that might be a tautology. We're of course going to be discussing the multiverse. We'll be reading articles on the multiverse and we'll be discussing my experimental setup, which can test for the existence of multiverses. We're going to be discussing time and the, what we think is the relationship between time and space in Einstein's space-time continuum. We'll be discussing black holes and wormholes, string theory. We're going to be discussing fundamentals such as black body radiation, electron energy levels, Higgs fields, the photoelectric effect. We'll be contemplating ideas and thoughts and progress towards fusion, the fundamental nature of magnetism, which has been a mystery for some time. I have some ideas that involve alignment of quantum spin. We'll get into that. We'll be discussing things like what is a neutron? What is a proton? What is a photon? What is an anion? and what is charge. It may come as a surprise to you that although we use charge as we use electromagnetism, as we understand charge, when we think about ions and fluids and solutions, we have no idea fundamentally what a positive charge actually represents or a negative charge. We'll be discussing aspects of dimensionality of the universe, which is fascinating absolutely important work by Stephen Wolfram recently on that. We'll be discussing as we go along on most of these topics, experimental falsifiability. We'll be getting somewhat into metamathematics. I've become enamored with that and certainly quantum biology. We'll be discussing the end of the universe. Pleasant as that topic may not be. Now, in terms of the analogy used in the article that I just read to you, the question arises, is it useful and necessary, as is implied in the title, about a type of magnetic soul? Is it useful and necessary to understand the fundamentals of how the universe works to imbue properties such as the term soul into something like a magnetic filament 
a filament of electromagnetic energy. The cosmic web is real. There's no doubt about it. And if you look at its dimensions and its scales, there's a beautiful picture in the article of a simulated cosmic web. It looks for all the world like filaments in a brain, interacting nerve cells. The similarity is uncanny. However, is it useful for us to imbue the idea, to entertain the idea that the universe itself is in fact conscious and do we need a fifth force to understand the mechanics and the origins of the universe? These fundamental questions have occurred to humanity since the beginning of time when humanity first looked up and was first capable, the first hominin brain was capable of asking the question, what are those? Perhaps it was very early in hominin evolution when the people who saw the stars, proto-people who saw the stars, said, what is, what is the sun? What is the moon? If you think about it, the earliest peoples on the planet, our direct ancestors and their relatives, all shared the same moon with us. They shared the same gravitational pull. They stumbled and tripped and fell. They scraped their knee. Perhaps they sat in awe of the beauty of the Milky Way after a hot summer's day. They slaked their thirst with the same water that we drink now. They spent their time procuring resources for themselves, for their mates, and for their offspring. We know very little about the social structure of early hominins, but we know that they had eyes that work as well as ours, as far as we can tell. What did they perceive? What of this massive universe did their brains put together as a part of their reality, and what stories did their minds conjure up? Just as we're doing now, comparing the universe to a living organism, the difference between us and them, I suppose, is the question of falsifiability. Pagosian, in the article that we just discussed, called for science to answer the question whether there was truly any ubiquitous magnetism throughout the universe. Is it a, truly a primordial component? Is it everywhere, even when matter is not present? These are the kinds of questions that fundamental physicists are working on now. I call them fundamental physicists because that combines the theoretical and empirical physicists. The fundamental physicists are all concerned about the rules. They call them laws, but the rules or the processes that the universe has followed in putting itself together the way that we find it. Fundamental physicists are having a field day there's so much new information, so much new thought, so many new ideas, so much new data. There, it's truly a wonderful time to be doing fundamental physics. It wasn't that way forever. There, there was a period of time where the business model uh, of academic physics created too many students, students who had no other prospects. It's like teaching someone how to be an aficionado in cooking, but never, never having a prospect of becoming a chef and being employed. It's like training someone to be a virtuoso on a violin, but there are no concerts within which they can play. This is cruel. However, I'm looking forward to a new future in which the general public can come to share the fruits of the knowledge of the training, the studies, the, theor the theorizing, the experimentation done by all of these students, whether they're currently employed in academia or not. Because we need good ideas, we need to come to a better understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe 
and there may be some very good orphaned ideas that are out there that are not mainstream. I'm very, very interested in finding them and bringing, helping to bring them forward. But how would we test for a, an omnipresent magnetism? The omnipresent magnetism, well, the first question to ask is why is that important? If magnetism itself is not understood mechanistically, we, we can create magnetism. We can create electromagnets. We can measure magnetism. We can find it in nature. But if itself as a process, the electromagnetic force itself and its relation to the other forces is not fully understood. And its role in the construction, if you will, of the universe is not fully understood, then we really we really should try to perceive of a test uh, to find out whether magnetism, in fact, traces all the way back to the beginning of the universe. And if you go to the deepest, darkest part of the universe where there is no matter that could generate magnetism, would you still find it? You know, its relation to radio waves the propagation of information through space is probably part of the key. Something must be traveling through space if the information carried on radio waves makes it across the voids. It, however, the loops and swirls of intergalactic space, this magnetic soul that is being conjectured Does it imbue, and do, do, is it incumbent upon us to also ponder of something larger and emergent, such as a universal consciousness? I'm not sure if it adds a great deal to the practical applications of magnetism. We can certainly play with magnets without wondering if we're altering the consciousness of the universe. We can create maglev trains. We can create engines and generators. But humanity's never satisfied. This is why we spread out across every continent. We're never satisfied with what we think we have. There may be something over the next horizon. How could we possibly test whether there is an omnipresent consciousness? Well, that would involve, I think, trying to communicate with it. If the universe is conscious, then how would we set up an empirical, objective, science-based test to communicate with the consciousness that we speculate is present? Now, I may be making a mountain out of a molehill, this idea that it's like a cosmic consciousness or a magnetic soul it may just be hyperbole. It may be some of the packaging that so many fundamental physicists abhor. However, that does not answer the question whatsoever on whether there is a greater consciousness that pervades the cosmos and runs through us and runs through this computer I'm using and runs through you and every individual that we know, whether we love them or hate them, we're all part of the same universe. If you could see radio waves, you would see a very different universe. You would see massive golden filaments stretching out from stars reaching each other. If you could see radio waves, and again, the article on dailygalaxy.com that I just read to you, The Invisible Universe, A Primordial Magnetic Soul Pervades the Universe, has some photos. But if you could see the radio filaments, you would naturally wonder what they are, such as you do when you see the stars. What are they? What are they made of? How did they get there? So these radio filaments are very real. That's not in question. There are many, many processes in cosmology that can generate radio f f 
bursts, radio fields. I said something earlier that gives away some of where I'm heading with this, and that the radio waves themselves have to travel through something. They can travel through from one part of space to another on something. What are they traveling on? We call it a magnetic field because magnetism is present, but what if you take the magnetism away? That's the more fundamental question. If you take magnetism away and that radio field isn't there, what would a radio wave travel on? What would a magnetic field reside upon? And these fields, the field as it's called, in a book by Lynn Metaggart, but as I prefer to call them, the fields, are represented as a given in string theory, but it's not altogether clear exactly what the fundamental nature of space in the deepest, darkest, furthest corner, if you will, what is present when nothing is there? And contemplating nothing is a hobby of mine. I could read books that are filled with zeros and contemplate on each page the significance of nothing. It's a very healthy thing to do, to contemplate nothing, because the moment that you contemplate it, you have something the very question becomes a snake traveling its own, chasing its own tail. The significance of nothing is everything. And if we could reach out there and sample space from the deepest, darkest corner, furthest from everything else, what would we find? It's a deeper question than what's in a vacuum, but it's related to that. So here on planet Earth, we're capable of creating vacuums. We have very powerful technology to do that. Light still travels through a vacuum. What is it traveling through if there's nothing there? These fundamentals and other questions like them will be asked and not answered. They will be reviewed and posed for discussion in the comments. Now, if you enjoy Talk Nerdy to me so far, I ask you to please like and share. Please comment with your questions. And of course, the normal due diligence to keep the studio going with podcasts like these and others that we have coming is to ask you to please travel today over to patreon.com and join other supporters in their support of WWDNYK Studios. If this is the first time that you've heard of us, WWDNYK stands for What We Do Not Yet Know. My name is Dr. James lyons -Weiler. It's been a pleasure sharing this first episode of Talk Nerdy to me with you. If you have ideas of articles that you'd like me to read and comment on, please feel free to share them in the comments. And if you know how to get a hold of me, email me or PM me. It's been a sincere pleasure spending this time with you. And I look forward to doing it again very soon.